Okay, this is the pre-roll for the Friday night Bible study for the 29th day of December 2017. We'll give the Hebrew date once we go live, first of all on Sabbath.tv and then on Facebook Live. Let's first, let's trigger, let's uh, roll in Sabbath.tv first of all. Stand by, I gotta get the button over there to it. Greetings to those of you uh, watching on Sabbath.tv. We're going to bring in the Facebook Live Sabbath service, live stream, Facebook Live page next. And greetings to those of you watching on Facebook Live. This is the Friday night Bible study for the 11th day of the 10th month on God's Holy Sacred Calendar. It's the 29th day of December 2017 on the pagan Roman calendar and we're still having software problems but I don't think that's a big deal for what we're doing tonight software problems in the sense that I I can't uh, use a camera and the, the virtual studio we normally telecast from so uh, all that means is you don't get to see my ugly mug tonight and we're gonna go right into where we left off last time on sabbath.tv with we read through chapter 6 of God's End Time Apostle Herbert Armstrong's book on the United States and the United Kingdom in prophecy. We're going to pick up tonight, again, where we left off after we finished chapter 6. We're going to pick up with chapter 7. Uh, and let me just switch over to where we could pick this up uh, in a continuing series without this Friday night Bible study introduction. We just pick it up from chapter 7. I'm going to switch to the microphone we've been recording with for these chapters from this booklet. So let me do that and then we'll just, uh, I'm just checking some uh, some uh, indicators to make sure we're, our live stream is going out on Facebook Live. Yes, we got the right colors for that. And on Sabbath.tv. Looks like we're we're good there too so let me switch over to the uh, other microphone and it's from this microphone that we'll uh, we'll use for chapter 7 and let me give that introduction and so I can pick up uh, and snip this into the whole series where we'll have one great big long video uh, with scrolling text reading aloud the entire book at you know once I finish this so here we are at chapter 7 the United States and the United Kingdom, the U.S. and the U.K., in prophecy from a book originally entitled The United States and British Commonwealth in Prophecy, written by God's end-time apostle Herbert W. Armstrong. We're now on chapter 7, Jeremiah's Mysterious Condition. And let me lean over here and take the... Uh, the lower third off that just tells everybody who's watching live that we're uh, we're doing this for the Friday night Bible study on the 29th of December 2017 which on the holy sacred calendar is the 11th day of the 10th month let me just comment on that i'm going to start the introduction to this chapter over again in just a moment but being at the 11th day of the 10th month the next feast day is going to be the 14th day after sunset of the first month of, the, of, the, of a new year on God's holy sacred calendar. And since there's, this is not a leap year this year, there's 12 months this year, so we have all of the 10th month to go, and then there will be the, the 11th month and the 12th month, and then just 14 days into the first month will be the next feast. So... That puts us from the 10th to 11th is one month, from the 11th to the 12th month is two months, from the 12th month to the first month is three months. So we're three months and three days away from the next feast day. So don't anybody sit there worrying like, ah, I missed, am I missing a feast coming up? No, you got three months and three days before the next feast comes along. And that will be the first feast of the year. It's not a holy day, but it is nonetheless the most solemn feast day of the entire year, and that's the Passover memorial that we'll do immediately after sunset the evening of the 14th of the first month in the new year. And we're talking about the new year on God's holy sacred calendar, not, not just this new pagan Roman year coming up in a few days 
you know, a couple days from now. But uh, all right, let's begin again. Let me get the lower third out of the way. Everybody hang on while I lean over to a, another b a bank of uh, buttons to be able to do that. Okay, so we got the lower third off and we're ready to begin. The United States and United Kingdom, the U.S. and the U.K. in prophecy from a book originally entitled The United States and British Commonwealth in Prophecy, written by God's end-time apostle Herbert W. Armstrong, read aloud for you tonight by yours truly, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. This is Chapter 7 of that book, U.S. and U.K. in Prophecy, entitled Jeremiah's Mysterious Commission. The overview of this chapter will have subchapters entitled Jeremiah's Strange Commission, Not Realized Today, Tearing Down the Throne, What About Jeconia? Where Did Jeremiah Go? Jeremiah Escapes, and the last subdivision of this chapter, Under Divine Protection. And now the intro to this chapter 7. We come now to one of the most fascinating and gripping phases of this strange story of Israel. Indeed, the very connecting link between prophecy and present-day fulfillment, yet totally unrecognized by theologians. After the house of Israel, the northern kingdom whose capital was Samaria, was driven into to Assyrian captivity between 721 and 718 B.C., the kingdom of Judah continued on in, in the southern part of Palestine known as Judea. They can, continued on in the southern part of Palestine known as Judea after the house of Israel was taken captive. At that time, Judah as a nation had not yet rejected the government and religion of God. God had continued to keep his covenant with David. David's dynasty had continued on the throne over part of the Israelites, the house of Judah, the Jews. He continued over that part of the Israelites, over the house of Judah, the Jews. But after Israel had become lost from view, Judah turned from the way turned from the ways and government of God going after the ways of the gentile nations sinning even worse than Israel until finally the eternal drove Judah too into national captivity and slavery before Judah's apostasy God had said through the through the prophet Hosea though you Israel play the harlot Yet let not Judah offend, Hosea 4, verse 15. But later, the Eternal said to Jeremiah, Have you seen what she did, that faithless one Israel, how she played the harlot? And her false sister Judah saw it. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her false sister Judah didn't fear, but she too went and played the harlot. Faithless Israel has shown herself less guilty than false Judah. Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through 11, Revised Standard Version. Here again, it is, it is made distinctly plain that the twelve tribes of Israel were divided into two totally separate nations, and yet opponents of the truth revealed in this book deny these plain scriptures and attempt to discredit those who reveal it. Now see how Judah, the Jews, more than 130 years after Israel's captivity, also was removed from their land. They were taken as slaves to Babylon, not to Assyria where Israel had been taken. And the Eternal said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, 
and will cast off this city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said my name shall be there. 2 Kings 23, verse 27. And so, more than 130 years after Israel's captivity, the time came when God caused the Jews also to be driven out of their land in national captivity and slavery. Jeremiah's strange commission. For this purpose, God raised up a very special prophet whose real call and commission few indeed understand. This prophet was Jeremiah. Jeremiah played a strange and little realized role in his captivity. Something of the importance of this mission may be gleaned from this significant fact. The Bible mentions three men only who were sanctified for their respective offices before they were born. And of these three, Jeremiah was the first. The other two were John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. The Eternal first spoke to Jeremiah when he was but a young lad, about, oh, some evidence indicates 17 years of age, 17 years of age. By the time his mission was completed, he was an aged, white-haired patriarch. This vital yet little-known call and commission is described in the opening verses of the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, the Eternal said to him, and before you were born, I consecrated you, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1, verse 5, Revised Standard Version. But Jeremiah was frightened, afraid. Ah, eternal God, he replied. Behold, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the eternal answered, Do not say, I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Verses 6 through 8. Then the Eternal put his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth. See, said God, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Verses 9 and 10. Or, as this tremendous commission is worded in the authorized version, to root out and to pull down, and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Notice Jeremiah was set over nations, more than one kingdom. He was a Jewish lad living in Judah. He was a prophet over Judah but not Judah alone, over nations, over kingdoms. He was set over these kingdoms to do two things. First, to pluck up or root out, to pull down or to overthrow. And second, to build and to plant, not realized today. Look at it in your own Bible. Jeremiah was used of God as a prophet to warn the nation Judah of their transgressions against God's government and ways. He was sent to warn this rebellious nation of impending punishment, their invasion and captivity at the hands of the Chaldean armed forces, unless they acknowledged their guilt and changed their ways. He was used as a go-between, an intermediary between the kings of Judah and Babylon. It's well known that Jeremiah 
was used in warning Judah of the impending captivity and the pulling down or overthrowing of the throne of David in the kingdom of Judah. It's generally understood that the house of Judah was invaded by the armies of King Nebuchadnezzar, that the Jews were taken captive to Babylon, that they ceased from being a kingdom, that there no longer existed a ruler of David's dynasty on the throne over the kingdom of Judah. When then, I'm sorry, what then does this mean? Did God at last forget his covenant promise to David that David's dynasty should never cease, that David's throne was established in Solomon to continue through all generations forever? Had God Almighty now forgotten that he had sworn that he would not alter this promise, even though the kings and the people rebelled and sinned? The faithfulness of God is at stake. The inspiration of the Holy Bible as this revealed word is at stake. But note it. See it in your own Bible. Jeremiah was divinely commissioned to pull down and to overthrow that very throne of David and Judah. But notice the second half of the commission. To build and to plant. To build and to plant what? Why, naturally, that which he was used in rooting out of Judah, the throne of David, which God swore he would preserve forever. Jeremiah was set over not just the one nation, Judah, but over nations, nations, over the kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel as well as Judah. He was used in rooting out that throne from Judah. Then what was Jeremiah commissioned to do in Israel? Notice the second half of his strange and little understood commission. To build and to plant. So far as the world knows, the last king to sit on that throne of David was Zedekiah of Judah. He was thrown down off the throne, and the throne rooted out of Judah in the year 585 B.C., nearly 600 years before Christ. What happened to that throne? Where was that throne between 585 B.C. and the time of Christ 600 years later? We know Jeremiah did not plant and rebuild it in Babylon. God had promised that David's throne should rule over Israelites through all generations, not over Gentiles. We have the history of the continuance of the Gentile throne in Babylon. David's throne was never again planted or built among the Jews. It was not reigning over the Jews in the time of Christ. The Jews were then under the Roman rule. Jesus did not ascend any such throne. The throne was not functioning in Judah. It was not existing at that place or over that people. It was not there for Jesus to take over. And Jesus said plainly that his kingdom was not of this present age. Yet he was born to sit upon this, this very throne of his father David. Luke 1, verse 32. But that throne was divinely commissioned to be planted and rebuilt by the prophet Jeremiah during his lifetime. Jeremiah was set over both Judah and Israel to be used in rooting out David's throne in Judah, but more, to plant and to build then of necessity among the house of Israel, lo, these many days without a king, among lost Israel, now supposing herself to be Gentile. Therefore, the identity and location of the replanting must remain 
hidden to the world until this time of the end in which we live. Tearing down the throne. The life and work of Jeremiah is a most fascinating story. The first chapters of the book of Jeremiah are devoted to his ministry, warning of the impending captivity of the Jews. He warned the kings, the priests, prophets, and people of Judah, delivering God's message. They threw him in prison, and they refused to heed or obey God. Then God caused their captivity. It's generally known that Babylon took Judah in three different stages. The first stage was in 604 B.C., a date about two years later than has been commonly reckoned, but a date now firmly established. 604 B.C., the land did not completely pass into the hands of these Gentile Babylonians, however, until a full time cycle of 19 years later, or 585 B.C. You can read the part played by Jeremiah in this captivity in the book of Jeremiah. But now notice an interesting fact. The last and final king recorded either in Bible or secular history as having sat on the throne of David was King Zedekiah of Judah. Remember his name, King Zedekiah. Now notice 2 Kings 24, verse 18. Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Now notice briefly a description of the final tearing down and rooting out of this throne of David. In the ninth year of Zedekiah king of Judah, in the tenth month, came Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah the king of Judah saw them and all the men of war, when they saw them and all the men of war, then they fled. But the Chaldeans' army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. Jeremiah 39, verses 1 through 7. In the 52nd chapter, first 11 verses, we find almost a word-for-word -word description of the same events with the, added, uh, with the added phrase, and put him, Zedekiah, in prison till the day of his death. These passages bring out these points. One, the king of Babylon slew all the sons of Zedekiah who were heirs to the throne of David. Who were heirs to the throne of David. He also slew all the nobles of Judah so as to leave no possible heirs for that throne. Third, three, finally, after putting out Zedekiah's eyes, the king who sat on David's throne was himself taken to Babylon, where he died in prison. For thus, as it appears, and as the whole world has believed, the throne of David ceased with no possible heirs or sons to keep the dynasty alive. Certain it is that from that day on, the throne never again has existed in Judah, in Jerusalem, or among the Jews. What about Jeconia? Jeconia. It's true that a former king of Judah was at that time in the dungeons of Babylon, and 
he had sons to continue David's line, a former king of Judah, former king Jeconia, parenthesis, Jehoiachin, taken the Babylon in chains, was restored to honor 37 years after the captivity. See 2 Kings 25, verses 27 through 30. He was given the title king, along with numerous other captive vassal kings. One of Jeconia's sons was Selathiel, who was the father of Zorobabel, the son of royal seed through whom Jesus Christ himself traced his royal ancestry back to David, Matthew 1, verse 12. And Zorobabel, or Zerubbabel, was the man God call, caused Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a decree giving him the governorship, not the crown of a king, to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God, the temple, 70 years after the captivity. Yet neither Jeconia nor any of his sons or grandsons reigned as king in Judah. Why? If there was a descendant of the line of David who lived through the captivity, why wasn't he restored to the throne when he was returned to Jerusalem? Why? Simply because God would not permit it. It is God who makes kings and unmakes them. God was determined to remove the crown of David from the ruling line of Pharez and place it on the head of a son of Zara. Yet a royal line straight from David had to remain in the area so the Christ could be born of David's seed yet hundreds of years in the future. And God also had to keep his promise to David that he, David, would never lack a descendant to sit on the throne. Many intricate and fascinating prophecies had to be carried out, some seemingly contradictory, a difficult job to perform, an awesome commission from God to Jeremiah. As I live, saith the Lord, though Konia, Jeconia, the, sons, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, though, though, though Jeconia were the signet upon my right hand, yet I would pluck thee thence. Jeremiah 22, verse 24. God had determined an end for this line of kings. He was removing the crown, not permitting Jeconia's sons to reign on Judah's throne. God was turning over, overturning the throne to another branch of Judah's family. God told Jeremiah forcefully, Thus saith the Lord, Write you this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper. Uh, shall, no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Jeremiah 22, verse 30. God spoke. Jeremiah wrote. History has designed and done a as God said, Jeconia had children. God himself caused this fact to be recorded. See 1 Chronicles 3, verse 17, and Matthew 1, verse 12. But as far as the throne of David was concerned, he was childless. None of his children ever occupied that throne. The crown had now been removed from the Pharez line, uprooted from Judah, any immediate candidates to the throne killed, and Jeconia incarcerated in a Babylonian prison, written childless as far as the throne was concerned by the command of God Almighty. 
Jeremiah had now accomplished the first part of his great commission. The throne had been rooted out, the kingdom torn completely down. Judah was now beginning her national punishment. Judah beginning her national punishment. Where did Jeremiah go? But what about the second part of Jeremiah's important commission? Jeremiah was among these captive Jews. He must be free to carry out the second part of his commission. So, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look well to him, and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto you. Jeremiah 39, verses 11 and 12. And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, Behold, I loose you this day from the chains which were upon your hand. If it seem, if it seem good unto you to come with me into Babylon, come, and I will look well unto you. But if it seem ill unto you to come with, with me into Babylon, forbear, behold, all the land is before you. Whither, whatever, wherever, whither it seems good and convenient for you to go, there you go, thither go. So the captain of the guard gave him victuals and a reward, money, and let him go. Jeremiah 40, verses 2 through 5. So Jeremiah, so Jeremiah was left absolutely free to do as he pleased, supplied even with expense money, and given complete freedom so that he might perform the second half of his mission. Where did he go? We come now to an amazing, fascinating, thrilling part of the book of Jeremiah, which has been almost entirely overlooked. Then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land, verse 6. Now, this Gedaliah had been made governor over a remnant of Jews in a remnant of Jews in the land by the king of Babylon. And since Jerusalem was destroyed, he had made Mizpah his headquarters. But the king of Ammon plotted with a Jew named Ishmael to assassinate Gedaliah. The plot was executed. The governor and part of the Jews were slain. Jeremiah was among the survivors. Then, then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters, and all the people that remained in Mizpah, whom Nebuzaradan, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard from Babylon, had committed to Gedaliah and carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. Jeremiah 41, verse 10. Ah, did you catch it? Read that passage again. Among these Jews were the king's daughters, daughters of Zedekiah, king of Judah, and of David's dynasty. King Zedekiah had died in prison in Babylon. Jeremiah 52, verse 11. All his sons had been killed. All the nobles of Judah had been killed. All possible heirs of Zedekiah to David's throne had been killed, except the king's daughters. Now we see why Jeremiah went to Mizpah. Jeremiah escapes. Soon a man named Jehonam, Jehonan replaced Ishmael as leader, and in fear of reprisals from Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldean army, Jehonan and the captains appealed to the prophet and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, 
Let, we beseech you, our supplication be accepted before you, and pray for us unto the Lord your God, that the Lord your God may show us the way wherein we may walk. Jeremiah 42, verses 2 and 3. They were like so many professing Christians today. They come to God's minister with solemn assurances that they surely do want to know God's will. They promise as these did, oh, we will obey the voice of the eternal our God, verse 6. But did they mean it? Such people seldom do. Human nature wants to be good or think it's good, but it does not want to do good. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and he told them not to fear, that he would protect and deliver them. But the people wanted to flee to Egypt. This the Lord warned them not to do. If they did, the sword of Nebuchadnezzar, which they feared, would overtake them there, and they would die. If we wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, God said, If you wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, God said, and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there, and there you shall die. Jeremiah 42, verses 15 and 16. But as people usually do, they rejected God's warning. You speakest falsely, Johanan answered, The eternal our God has not sent you to say, Go not to Egypt. Go not into Egypt. Jeremiah 43, verses 2 and 3. So Johanan and all the people obeyed not the voice of the eternal. Verse 4. People who loudly professed to want to do God's will usually will not accept God's word as being his will unless it is their will. And so Johanan took all the remnant of Judah, even men and women and children, and the king's daughters, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch the son of of Jeriah, Jeremiah's scribe or secretary. So they came into the land of Egypt, verse forty-three, Jeremiah forty-three, verses five through seven. On reaching Egypt. God warned these Jews again through Jeremiah that they should die there by the sword and famine, and none shall return but such as shall escape. Jeremiah 44, verses 12 through 14. Yes, a few in this company as under divine protection. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, a few in this company are under divine protection. A divine mission is to be performed. They shall escape. The eternal continues. Yet a small number that escape, yet a small number that escape the sword, shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. Jeremiah 44, verse 28. Under divine protection. Baruch was Jeremiah's constant companion and secretary. It's important to note, it's important to note here, God's promise of protection to him. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto you, O Baruch, behold that which I have planted, I will pluck up even this whole land. But Your life will I give unto you for a prey in all places whither you goest. Jeremiah 45, verses 2 through 5. Baruch's life, like Jeremiah's, was under divine protection. Now, previously, the Eternal had said to Jeremiah, Verily, truly, it shall be well with your remnant with your remnant, the only remnant left for Jeremiah's mission of transplanting the throne was the king's daughters. Verily, truly, verily, continued the eternal. Same verse. I will cause the enemy to entreat you well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. Jeremiah 15, verse 11. 
This God literally did, as described in chapter 39, verses 11 and 12, and chapter 40, verses 2 through 6, which I've covered previously. Notice, it is to be well with the royal material given to Jeremiah with which to build and to plant. It is to be well with the royal material given to Jeremiah with which to build and to plant. And Jeremiah is to be protected and to go to a land that he knows not. Who else was to go to a land they knew not? The ten-tribed birthright kingdom Israel. So Jeremiah and his little royal remnant are to escape out of Egypt, return to Judah, and then where? To the place where the lost ten tribes had gone, as we shall see. Now let, now let Isaiah complete this prophecy. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they shall escape out of Mount Zion. The zeal of the Eternal of hosts, the, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Upward, Isaiah 37, verses 32 and 31. This same prophecy is found also in 2 Kings 19, verses 30 and 31. It is a prophecy given through Isaiah in the 14th year of the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah when King Sennacherib of Assyria threatened invasion of Judah. It was a prophecy to happen later not during Hezekiah's reign. Some critics seeking to overthrow this basic and important truth argue that this same remnant is mentioned also in 2 Chronicles 30, verse 6. But that event is not a prophecy, but an historic account of an event in the first year of Hezekiah, and that remnant did not escape from Jerusalem but they were Jews who escaped from Sennacherib's forces threatening invasion of Judah. They escaped into, not out of Judah. And nothing is said here about taking root downward and bearing fruit upward, as in both Isaiah 37 and 2 Kings 19. This prophecy is so important, it is recorded twice. It does refer to the remnant to escape later to Jeremiah's escape. This remnant, this prophecy is so important, it is recorded twice. It does refer to the remnant to escape later to Jeremiah's escape. This remnant with Jeremiah, at least one of the two, this remnant with Jeremiah, at least one of the king's daughters, shall take root downward, that is, be replanted, and then bear fruit upward, be built. Has God failed in his solemn covenant to keep alive David's throne? Where was this planting and building? Can we find it in God's word? We can. The place and the people among whom the throne was reestablished are clearly identified. And that will be exciting to read about as we go into the next chapter, chapter 8. Join us again next time here on COGTV.org, Sabbath.tv, as we go into the next chapter, chapter 8, from the United States and British Commonwealth in prophecy. Now we call it the U.S. and the U.K., the United States and the United Kingdom in prophecy. Again, a book written by God's end-time apostle Herbert W. Armstrong. And brethren, we'll pick up with that chapter 8, the next chapter, next time. <laughs> All right, friends, and that's it for this uh, Friday night Bible study here on Sabbath.tv from cogtv.org. We'll plan to be back here 
in the daytime portion of this Sabbath, I, I guess, yeah, we can say in the morning, because this is the evening of the same day, the Sabbath day. It's on the pagan Roman calendar. It's called Friday night, but that's only something man has done. That's not God's doing. And uh, before I sign off, let me just, as a reference, let me kick that lower third back on the screen. Hang on while I lean way across here and hit the button that turns that on. All right, I think that's that button because I just want to, as we sign off, I want to put the date back up here so you know where we're at, where we are. Uh, it's going to be the same date in the morning that we have here tonight for Sabbath Eve. It'll still be the eleventh day of the tenth month on God's holy sacred calendar, the calendar that Jesus Christ will be using as the King of Kings after He ushers in and restores God's kingdom back to this earth, and we will not be using actively from day to day the old pagan Roman calendar anymore, except for possibly to refer back to dates from historical records, but then we'll tie those dates into, you know, God's sacred calendar, but we'll only do it for cross-reference back to this present evil world uh, that instituted this calendar in an effort to do away with or hide or cover up or extinguish God's calendar. But on that pagan Roman calendar that we have to live with today in this pagan Roman world, it's Friday night, they call it, the 29th day of December, 2017. And that's it for this Friday night Bible study. Thank you for joining us tonight, dear friends. And as we pray and ask God to please help us get our software working again where I can stick my ugly mug in your face <laughs> as I talk to you. And, uh, and, um, and so that I can get World Watch back on the air. Uh, you know, I'm hoping we'll be back on real soon. Maybe as soon as the pagan Roman calendar turns into the first week in January, I can have World Watch back on. Well, I, you know what? I got a way I can patch some stuff together and try to get back on even tomorrow night. But it's a real effort, and I sure am hoping we can resolve uh, things with the software companies wanted kind of strung us along while we were using a long trial from them talking to us like they were just going to you know give us as a church give us the uh, as a church ministry give us the uh, a license to the software but then uh, once, once the trial expired they said uh, oh well we're not able to give out it we're not giving out any right now if you you know want to continue in it send us your money <laughs> which I didn't have to send them and so then I went back to negotiating with the previous company, and uh, they haven't fixed things that were a problem that made me go to the second company yet. And, and they're wanting not only one update, but now another price update, because they stopped the update that didn't work anyway and have come out with another update that doesn't work right either, and they, they're wanting a second batch of money for that. I gave them the first batch of money for the... For the one update that didn't work, I spent a whole year struggling with that. Every night we get on the air, so hope you don't mind if I complain a little bit. Mr. Armstrong used to do that on Friday nights when he would talk about problems in the work that we needed prayer for. And uh, so I need a prayer for this. This software is driving me just up the wall with uh, it, it, something that's not yet resolved. I'm very close to resolving it. I. I'll uh, maybe talk to you another time after I do some more prayer about it and see where we are. But I may write to just a few of you that have have uh, voluntarily been helping me out before. But um, I will appreciate in the minimum that those of you who like the program and we do, that you pray God will help me work this out. I will appreciate that for your sake and mine too uh, very, very much because I've been given a little commission to do this to keep this uh, Sabbath.tv going and to keep WorldWatch.tv daily news related to the Bible and prophecy going. And we've had an interruption for going on four weeks now on that. We've had some interruptions before, but I've always managed to, to uh, struggle through and get back through the crack and on top of it again. But let me sign us off. Wish you a good, pleasant uh, Sabbath Eve of sleep. And be ready to be with us early morning. We start early here in the United States so that we can be streaming live as brethren in the United Kingdom have asked me to do so that it's still well in Sabbath time before sunset so that they can tune in to the live stream over there. So what we'll probably do tomorrow is 
pick up with chapter 8. And, you know, we'll get back to playing Mr. Armstrong, but this book was written by Mr. Armstrong, and he encouraged us to read it. And so I'm using the modern conveniences of, of video to do scrolling text of the book while I, you know, try to read it with a little bit of, um, of um, easy to listen, and, you know, under, not just dry, dull reading, but it... I try to make it easy for you to picture what's going on as I read it. I hope, I hope I'm doing a, a, a an acceptable job or a good job for you, actually. But I, you know, I hope I, I, I do my best at it uh, while while I struggle with stuff around here. But Brendan, I'm happy to see the Sabbath come. I hope you are too. And uh, let me wish you a, a Shabbat Shalom, a good evening's sleep, and hope you'll join us again in the morning time here on the Sabbath on Sabbath TV cogtv.org and on the sabbath service page on facebook live until next time your host here on cogtv.org sabbath.tv Stephen lloyd gilbert saying shabbat shalom happy sabbath talk to you later